Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode eight of my Whiskey 101s. Uh, the last couple of shows I've been doing brand history or distillery history, because uh, the history of some of these distilleries are absolutely fascinating. Several hundred years of history, more so than that with Highland Park. Uh, but a great, great set of distilleries and stories and back, uh, back uh, information to share with you. So thank you very much for tuning in to this one. Now, we did McAllen, we did Highland Park, and now we're moving on to our other single malt. We have three single malts in our portfolio. Uh, this one is the awesome Glenrothes. If you know anything about Scotch, you'll know that this is, that is a power brand. Uh, and it has been long before it was bottled as a single malt. And we'll definitely go into that as time goes on. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the name. Uh, one of the things I get asked regularly when I do my, my tastings, I used to be the McAllen National Brand Ambassador for five years. Uh, and people say, what, why are so many Scotches called Glen something? Who is this Glen? And why does he keep setting up distilleries? No. In Scotland, a Glen is a valley. So it's, it's the valley... And then the next word is the name of the river that runs through the valley. So Glen Rothis is really just the valley of the River Rothis. The River Rothis runs through the town of Rothis uh, in Speyside in Scotland. Macallan is a Highland malt. It falls just outside of the jurisdiction to be a Speyside. But Glen Rothis is a 100% true Speyside single malt scotch. Uh, the reason so many of them are called Glens is a Glen, a, a little valley traditionally was the best place to illicitly make whiskey. If you're making whiskey illegally, you want to do it in a little quiet valley with trees so the smoke dissipates through the trees and no one, the tax man can't find you, basically. So that's why there's so many, you know, Glenlivet, Glenvirith, Glenmorangy, Glenrothes. These are all named after the valley. Now, Glenrothes is a highly sought after top malt or dress malt. Now, what that means is, uh, back in the day, blended whiskey was all the rage. And the single malt distilleries basically were set up to, f uh, to, um, uh, to, to uh, supply liquid for the blends. And Glenrothes was set up specifically for this region and uh, for this reason. It wasn't just that people were making alcohol and then blending came along. Well, this was set up specifically for blending. And one of the other things it sets it apart is very, very unusually... Glenrothes has a cooperage on site. A cooperage is the, the people who make the barrels. You know, they put the staves together and the big rings and they, they bring it together and they forge these, these incredible casks. We actually have a cooperage on site to repair and to rebuild casks. So it's very unusual to have that. Normally you send them off to Clyde Cooperage or whoever else, but Glenrothes has one on site. Now, I said that Glenrothes was set up specifically for blending. It was actually set up by a guy who was working at Macallan at the time. Uh, it was James Stewart. James Stewart started a company called James Stewart and Co. Uh, and in the 1870s, he decided that this Scotch thing is going very well. Blending is taking off. Uh, I want to create a distillery that makes a very fruity, light, elegant liquid. McCallum is quite rich and powerful and unctuous, but I want something lighter and gentler just to have different expressions out there. And that's specifically uh, what uh, James Stewart uh, went out to try and create. He actually bought a sawmill which used to sit on the site uh, where the distillery is now and the idea of, uh, of creating a lighter style of whiskey. But just after they had started planning and getting the money together and started building, there was a banking crisis and it almost scuppered the entire project and they were bailed out at the last second by a loan, uh, a, a sort of grant, a loan, a donation let's call it, from a local church of £600. I think I spent more than that on this jacket. Uh, £600 uh, is about $800. Now, in those days, 1870s, that was a lot of money and it helped them get the project back up and running. I just love the fact that on a Sunday, the minister is up there in the pulpit going, Thou shalt not drink. Stay away from the demon drink. While he's actually using the donations from the congregation to build a distillery. Fantastic. How Scottish is that? So the distillery was finished in uh, 1879. I could have just looked down at the top of the bottle. 1879 uh, is when it was uh, finally finished and the brand was founded. But right at the start, it was a very shaky and turbulent history. Uh, first off, the first whiskey ran off the still. The very first run 
when they finished building and started making whiskey, uh, was on the 28th of December, 1879. Now, for those of you who know your Scottish history, the, 80, the 28th of December uh, 1879 is a very, very dark day in Scottish history. It was the date of the Tay Rail Disaster. The Tay is a river and the estuary at Dundee is very wide and they built this single track train bridge across this wide estuary. And on the 28th of December, middle of the winter, in a big storm, the thing collapsed under the weight of the train and the train went in and they all died. 75 people perished that night. So that was a dark day to start making your whiskey. But the tragedy didn't end after that. Uh, in 1896, uh, extension work began on a brand new still house uh, and a malt kiln and we doubled the stills from two to four. But then one year later in 1897, uh, before the work was finished, there was a huge serious fire that destroyed a whole bunch of the distillery. Uh, you know, you're just about to expand, you're just, you're, you're doing well and, and suddenly a fire rips through the distillery and scuppers a bunch of your plants yet again. Uh, there was another explosion in 1903 and more serious damage uh, to the distillery. Of course, remember, you're, you, you're, you're working with overproof alcohol, you're working with high, high alcohol. Some of it's running off the stills at 90%. We are capturing around that 65% alcohol, high alcohol. So all it takes is one flame and woof, and that happened regularly, unfortunately, uh, over at Glenrothes. But the big one was in 1922. Uh, there was a fire in warehouse number one. Not in the still house, it was in the warehouse where all the whiskey was. Apparently, the great uncle of the distillery manager was in um, repairing casks and he knocked over a candle and everything went up. And they lost 200,000 gallons, imperial gallons. Uh, that's the same as 910,000 litres. So that's nearly a million litres were lost in that fire, in that explosion. Uh, and apparently, uh, the villagers, you know, you would think, you would think, oh, the, the distillery's on fire. All the villagers come running out with cups and buckets. And you would think, fantastic, they're going to get water from the river Rothis and chuck it on the fire. No, they were out to collect the whiskey from the streets and they were drinking it from the streets. How Scottish is that? It's the most Scottish thing I've ever heard. Uh, apparently, the next day, the cows were swaying in the fields and the trout were easier to catch than normal in the burn, in the stream. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. Some of these older stories tend to be a little embellished, but I would love that to be true. So moving on, the next piece of the history that I thought was really interesting was uh, in 1923. So obviously uh, one year later, a partnership started with a company called Berry Brothers and Rudd. Berry Brothers and Rudd are a wine and spirits importer, exporter. Uh, these days they've got their own labelings, independent bottler, a fantastic British company, a powerhouse company. Uh, but they partnered with Glenrothes because they'd realised at this point that Glenrothes were making, was making fantastic dress malt. So they wanted to use it for, for their blends. And the first thing they did was create a brand that became one of the biggest brands at that time in the 1920s, Cutty Sark. Now, these days, Cutty Sark is that green bottle that sits at the back of your grandma's liquor cabinet. But in those days, in 1920s or so, um, this was the, the, the uh, brand to have. Uh, this was the blended scotch that launched the blended category in America. Now, if you know your American history, you might know that uh, the 1920s was a, a bit of a tetchy time for alcohol in America. Prohibition. I think it was 1920 to 1933. I could be wrong. Matt Holbrey will know. He'll, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so during Prohibition, you, you know, alcohol was illegal. So a guy called Captain William S. McCoy, Bill, Bill McCoy, Captain Bill McCoy, uh, was a rum runner, was an alcohol smuggler. And he was smuggling in Curry Sark. The Americans loved it. It's a very light, gentle uh, blend. They absolutely loved it. And he was running in. There was other whiskey smugglers, right? But... Bill McCoy, Captain uh, William S. McCoy, was the only one, when you bought that cask of Cutty Sark, when you bought that alcohol, it was exactly 100 proof. It was exactly 50% alcohol. Uh, they didn't steal some and water it down. It was always 100% exactly what you thought you were going to buy. There was no, no uh, stealing. And that's where the term, the real McCoy, comes from. 
I said in my blurb 20 minutes ago, you will have known the name of this smuggler. When you say that's the real McCoy, you're talking about Captain Bill McCoy. And that's the curry sack. The curry sack is the, the, it was the fastest tea clipper in the world at the time. Uh, and if I hear one more person call this brand Cutty Shark, I'm going to set the sharks on you. So don't. So Barry Bells and Rudd uh, were, have been involved since 1923 and right up until more modern times. Uh, in 1920, sorry, in 1962, uh, there was another fire, yet another fire, and it destroyed some of the, uh, the buildings. But it, it was actually quite beneficial because it, was, it afforded the opportunity for expansion. They actually used that opportunity to expand. They were thinking of expanding uh, that wall. We didn't need that wall anyway. Yeah, that's fine. So there we are. Now, Right at the start of this piece, I said that Glenn Rothes was basically uh, rescued from uh, condemnation or, 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 or the, the project nearly didn't get off the, the ground if it wasn't for a £600 donation from the local church. And Glenn Rothes has never really forgotten that tie to the church. There's loads of references all the way through the bottlings, through uh, areas on site. Uh, part of the distillery itself is a graveyard. Uh, it, the, the burn runs through the middle of the distillery and there's a graveyard right there and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. But uh, because of the wanting to create a very light, fruity, gentle alcohol, they decided on very, very high stills. So if you go to the Glenrothes distillery, the still house is huge. The ceiling is absolutely enormous and it's called the Cathedral of Scotch. It feels like you're in a church. There's windows at the end and it's kind of designed like a cathedral. So the, the actual building itself is known as the Cathedral of Scotch. Uh, and in 1989, they bought the old uh, minister's house on Manse Bray. A manse is the, the house that the minister lives in and a bray is a hill. So they bought, uh, what was it called? Um, uh, Rothes House and they rebuilt it, remodeled it uh, and had it as their own. Uh, they ploughed money into that. Uh, also in 2007, they transformed the old brewer's office and called it the Inner Sanctum, another reference to the church. And then in 2012, we launched the Global Travel Retail. You know, the, uh, when you go to airports, there's the travel retail bottles that are different. And all three of them had church references. Uh, there was the, uh, the Man's Reserve, the Elder's Reserve and the Minister's Reserve, all church terms. But... Ladies and gentlemen, I think the greatest link to the world of spirituality comes from a very, very strange setup, a very, very strange occurrence. Uh, years ago, another distillery called Glen Grant was set up by Major Grant. I think it was Major John Grant set up uh, Glen Grant. Now, Major, Major Grant was a traveller, adventurer, socialite, and he went to Africa, went to Zimbabwe on a big game hunt. And while he was there, he met this guy walking, poor, poor uh, farmer guy walking with this little kid. And he, he asked him about the kid and he said, the kid's an orphan. I don't know what to do with him. He was quite elderly, the, the guy that had the kid. And uh, Major Grant uh, brought the boy back to Scotland from Africa, from Zimbabwe. Brought him back to Scotland and educated him, gave him a job, looked after him. Uh, and his name was uh, Biawa, I have to, I have to read it, Biawa uh, Makalanga, Biawa Makalanga, right? But because he found him on the side of a road, they nicknamed him Byway. So if you look up Byway in Glenrothes, there's this amazing history of this African lad that was brought over and given a job, and he, you know, he went to school, loved, he learned to love football, he, he played for Rothes FC. Phenomenal, phenomenal, crazy, crazy situation, Byway, right? So Byway had a, an amazing life and he died aged around 80 because he didn't know when he was born because he was orphaned, he didn't have papers. He died around 80 years old in 1972 and he's buried in the graveyard at Glenrothes because he helped out at Glenrothes and he helped out at uh, uh, Glen Grant. So they buried him in the, uh, uh, the, the cemetery there at Glenrothes. But he didn't lay still for long. In 1980, there was a, a new still house being put in. Uh, they, they, they were working on more expansion and they put in a new still a new still house. And still number three never worked properly. And as they were building it, it's, it's just things weren't right. And almost immediately, they started to see the ghost of Byway regularly. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was whispering. And it was a, a big sort of open secret. And it wasn't just like the occasional. All the time. They just couldn't get rid of Byway. 
Uh, and eventually the, stage, the, uh, the distillery manager found out from the, the whisperings and decided to look into it. So what he did, he had a friend who was a, um, a professor of pharmacology uh, in Belfast called Cedric Wilson, Professor Cedric Wilson, who was a pharmacist, but he was also really interested, uh, you know, kind of an expert in his day of uh, spirituality, um, uh, the paranormal, and in particular, ley lines. So what he went and found out was when they were rebuilding, they'd actually damaged one of the ley lines, a ley line that runs through a bunch of archaeological sites in Scotland, a very, very important ley line was broken and disturbed. And that was, he, his opinion was that that's what had, uh, you know, made the ghost of Byway rise. And he, having never been to the distillery of Cedric Watson, he walked straight into the, uh, the, the cemetery, straight up, to Byway's grave, without even looking around, straight up to Byway's grave, spoke gently to the, to the graveside, and then they, they rammed iron rods into the ground in particular places to realign the byline, and he was never seen of again. That's one of Scotland's really, really uh, long-standing ghost stories. Uh, I think that's fascinating. I really absolutely do. So whether that's true or not, I don't know. If you go there and you see him, you have to make sure that you tell me. Uh, moving on in history, in 1982, there was another rebuild, expansion again. Uh, extended the still halls to five uh, wash stills and five spirit stills. And then in 1987, Glenrothes released the first single malt, a 12-year-old. And almost immediately, it was abandoned. They decided they, couldn't, they, they didn't have the consistency they needed to, to make it. They didn't really understand maturation as well as we do now. By the way, if you want to know more about maturation, Two, three, three videos ago, I did a piece, four, uh, on uh, maturation. Uh, the one after that is on distillation, if you want to know more about those particular areas of Scotch creation. Uh, because they, they couldn't get the, the right stuff to continue the, the 12 year old, they decided to go down a slightly different path. And uh, we released the vintages. Uh, in 1993, we released the first of the vintage. Uh, releases. It was the uh, Vintage 1979. This isn't the Vintage 1979, this is a Vintage Reserve. But under Ber Berry Brothers and Rudd, this was the style of the bottle and this was the style of the label and there's a whole bunch of uh, reserves. There's a, a sherry cask reserve, a bourbon cask reserve, a bunch of vintages. Pioneering concept at the time did very, very well. But then uh, in... Uh, oh no, actually that's the next piece. The literally only used 2% of the, the liquid they have. Two casks out of 100 are good enough to go into Glenrothes to become the single malt. And that uh, remains today. Today, only 2% of the overall uh, stock can be used uh, in Glenrothes as a single malt. And then finally, the final piece of information, in 2017, Berry Brothers and Rudd sold the, uh, the, the rights back to us. They actually bought the rights seven years ago in exchange for Cutty Sack. We bought Cutty Sack as a brand and we sold them the bottling rights, not the distillery, the bottling rights to Glenrothes. Uh, and then in 2017, we bought the bottling rights back. Now, what we did at Edrington, I think is genius, right? You know, all these reserves, the vintages, the amazing whiskies but slightly confusing vintage reserve, vintage, vintage 79, sherry bourbon reserve, little bit confusing. So what did we do? We launched an age statement range. Uh, there's the 12, the Whiskey Maker's Cut, which isn't an age statement, uh, it's a slightly overproof. All of the master distillers love to bottle around uh, 47, 48%. Uh, this one's at 48.8, I don't remember. And the, the 18, and there's the 25 as well. So we, the first thing we did was, was make these labels very colourful. The bottle remains because we love that little hand grenade bottle. We introduced an age statement range and it absolutely took off. And that's where we are right now with Glen Rothes. So that's the history. I think it's fascinating. There's way more I could have covered as all, or so much more I could have talked about, but those were the highlights for me. Hope you enjoyed that uh, and tune in to the next one, which I'll be doing in a couple of days and I'll be uploading to YouTube then as well. So to the top camera, thank you very much. I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.